Hey, I think I'll just we'll just get started there. So thank you everyone for joining our virtual event on creating a modern intelligent workplace with the Microsoft Power Platform. So just a couple of housekeeping things to start with. So you'll notice you guys are all on mute. So if, if you have any questions you want to interact with the speakers, just please use the, the chat function. We, we we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. So really keen to get some questions and kind of get get talking to you guys. Session has been recorded, uh, so we can, we can share that with any of your colleagues who couldn't make it along today. Um, we're joined by Dr. Jim Hamill, who's a Transformation Advisor for Bridgel, and Gail McLean, who's our Practice Lead on our Microsoft 365 area. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Jim and get the session started. OK, Ryan, thank you. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to, to the the session and thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, if I can just re reiterate uh, Ryan's comment about the chat forum, we, we are trying to make this as um, interactive as as possible. Uh, so please do feel free to use the chat forum to ask any questions, to post any comments um, and so on. If we if we were doing this on a face to face Basis, it would probably be considered bad manners for the group to start talking with each other during the presentations. The benefit of doing it online, and I personally love this aspect of doing it online, is that we can have two parallel sessions running at the same time. We can have the session where Graham and I are speaking, uh, and then we can have the session on, on the chat chat forum, so please do feel free to, to use it. Um, two, two of the key messages that will emerge from the session today, first of all, planning, planning pace. Uh, and we obviously will discuss the potential of, of power apps, but there's a key message uh, that it has to be planned properly. And secondly, that planning um, and the successful implementation of Power Apps and Power Platform uh, projects and initiatives very much requires a team effort. It requires a combined effort from those, let's say, with the technology stroke software development background, but also involving people from uh, the core business across different functions and especially frontline frontline customer facing staff and that that is represented in in the group today we've had a very good response to to this and I would say the group's probably split half and half between those who who have more of a technology uh, software development background and those who who have more of a business background. And that's reflected in the two speakers today as, as well. Um, Graham will take Graham will speak about the technology and software development as, aspect of Power Apps Power Platform. My background, as many of you already know, is very much a, a business school background. So my my role this morning is effectively just to uh, try and set the scene. Um, before I pass over to to Graham. Um, if I can start just with a very, very short story of how I developed an interest in, in Power Apps and the Power Platform, because I think it's very relevant to, to, the, to, the, to today's session. Um, it was really a year ago, in fact, in October last year, and I was ready, getting ready to to go to the third session on a senior executive programme that I was running for one of the UK's largest housing um, groups. And the programme was called Leading in a Digital Era or Leadership in a Digital Era. And this is the third session in cohort two already previously been a cohort one and by that time um, I had I was already familiar with many of the the day-to-day -day issues facing that organization but also the longer term transformation objectives of the organization 
And on that day, the participants were due to present in a Dragon's Den where they were presenting mini projects that, that were I looking at a specific challenge that the organisation faced and how digital could overcome that. And then that morning I uh, read that uh, Microsoft had just uh, announced the general release of uh, Power Arts Power Platform and immediately started humming one of my favourite songs, which is a Stone Roses song called um, This Is What I've Been Waiting For. Uh, and I could immediately uh, see the potential of this for uh, not only the, the organisation that um, I was working for at, at the time, but also for a range of other organisations. And I have absolutely no technology or software development background, but I immediately thought this is the one, this is the one we've been waiting for. OK, so moving to towards the agenda today, Graham, you want to stick the agenda slide up? Thanks. Um, I'm going to start just with a five minutes on the why of, of Power Apps Power Platform. What are the benefits and, and why is it specifically uh, so important now? We'll then pass quickly over to Graham that will explain obviously in an awful lot more detail uh, what it is, how it works, using a lot of case examples that Graham and his team have been, been working on recently. And then we'll come back and look at some of the planning issues, the organisation and the governance issues. So in terms of the background to this, you want to jump a slide, uh, Graham, thanks. You know, try, trying to place this in, in the context of of where we are at, at the moment. I mean, everyone would agree that the whole COVID thing has been a wrecking ball, not only to our personal lives, but also to our business lives. But looking at this from a more optimistic perspective, I think the pandemic um, has unfrozen a lot of the past constraints that organisations have, have faced in terms of trying to transform the way we do things around here. And hopefully it has provided us with a, a once in a lifetime opportunity now that those constraints have been uh, removed, providing a once in a lifetime opportunity to build what we at Bridge all call the modern intelligent workplace, the agile, fast moving, collaborative, data driven uh, workplace that is going to be absolutely essential for survival and growth in a volatile and uncertain and digital world. And as I argued at a session we had yesterday, um, the question why become a modern intelligent workplace, I think that argument has, has been won now. And the only question now is how do we collectively accelerate our journeys to becoming to become modern and intelligent. And that is really the reason that I personally am very excited about the potential of Power Apps and Power Platform, uh, because implemented effectively, um, I think it can really accelerate our journeys uh, to becoming more modern and intelligent. The key term there is obviously used used effectively and uh, Graham and, and I will be <clears throat> obviously trying to provide some advice on, on that. So in terms of business benefits, Graham, you want to just jump to the next slide? I don't think there's any any need for me to, to go through this bullet point by bullet point. The potential business of um, power apps and, and the power platform have, are becoming very well known in terms of taking productivity to, to new levels, empowering employees, higher return on investment, lower costs, and, and for a lot of organisations, building that operational excellence that is going to be required in the what's now called the new the new economy. Um, and some of the examples that 
that uh, Graham will run through supports all of that and also in terms of engaging with with customers and we would include their B2B customers, not just B2C customers. Um, Graham, if you flip on to the next next slide here. Again, I don't want to elaborate on, on this, but there is a, a growing body of research here showing the, the potential of um, Power Platform and both Gartner, both Gartner and Forrester have produced uh, very interesting reports on um, the Microsoft Power Platform being a leader in the mar Magic Quadrant, uh, the Forest report, uh, was about the return on investment uh, uh, in Power Platform that I can't remember what it was, but it was several hundred in a short period of, of time. Uh, so just one final slide from me, Graham, if you want to jump. So the question, <coughs> why now? You know, why are we, we running this session now? And why is Power, Power Platform so, so important? You know, Gartner have have predicted that within the next four years, something like two thirds of all app development activity will be be low, co low code, and Power Platform will obviously take the lion's share of of that. Two reasons: it's time for our organisations to really think about embedding embedding the power platform at the core of our modern intelligent workplace strategy. And those two reasons, very briefly, is that short term, I think everyone on here today, short term, we need as organisations to build what's known as resilience. We need to build agility, we need to build responsiveness, we need to streamline processes, we need to automate processes just to survive over the, ne the next year or so. Um, because this new normal that people refer to a period of prolonged, uncertain, turbulent change. And at the same time as building resilience, we need to accelerate our journeys to becoming more modern and more intelligent. And I think implemented effectively power apps and the power platform um, can deliver on those two organisational objectives. Um, so I think that's enough for for me. I will join the later on um, in in the session. So thanks for listening to me. If you get any specific questions for me, just stick them on on the chat forum, please. Um, but without further ado, do I'd like to just pass over to to Graham to take us through. Uh, the what is Power Platform and illustrating that with some use case examples. Graham. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for thanks for that. Um, and I think this is a good kind of a uh, scene setting um, piece there about um, you know Power Platform and how it's um, kind of landed and and what its, its uses could be as well. So. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm Graham McLean, so I head up the, the SharePoint and the Microsoft 365 um, practice for, for Bridgel. Um, you through this section. Um, so what I want to do here is just kind of introduce the Power Platform um, in a bit more detail. Um, you know, where, where does it fit in? What are some of the kind of key components um, to the Power Platform? And then I'll take you through some of the use cases. So I'll take you through some kind of Microsoft, you know, like some kind of broad use cases. Um, and then I'll talk to you about a um, more specific kind of customer use cases. So, you know, projects that we've carried out um, and they're particularly more from the kind of the use case example. So we'll see a bit of the technology and a bit of the integration that can be done. Um, but really, we'll be able to see, you know, the process, what the process was at the start um, and what we were able to transform the process into. Um, and hopefully some of the benefits that we can get out of that and some of the savings that we can get out of that. Um, I just want to point out again that obviously the chat's available on there. Um, I've got one of my team, uh, Sammy, is available on the, on the chat. So if there's any questions as I go through this, um, it'd be ideal if you could kind of put them in the chat in the first instance. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of keep an eye on the chat and at kind of appropriate points, I'll try and 
um, pick out any questions as well if it's <clears throat> so just moving on to kind of set the scene a little bit. So the Power Platform is Microsoft's kind of low code uh, platform offering. Um, so you can think of it, you know, instead of starting from scratch, writing code, um, you can think of it as a kind of mix of drag and drop uh, technology and, and Excel type formulas. Um, kind of pieced together with lots of lots of different components. So it's made up of four kind of core elements, if you like, and they're along that that top line there. So we've got Power BI, uh, which you know some of you will be familiar with. So that's an application that can be used to just kind of surface data, you know, with it within your organisation uh, and outside your organisation, um, to help you just display rich reporting and, and mm -hmm. analytics. Um, you know, and that can either be as part of an application or that can be, you know, kind of standalone um, as well. It helps to kind of let organizations get people within the organization to self-serve themselves reports. So the idea is that you can surface the data and whoever needs to consume that data can come in and you know kind of help themselves to that data. Um, so you're not having to prepare reports and get them get them sent out to people. Then the next one, then we've got Power Apps. So this is a an application development environment um, that helps you produce applications in in lots of different formats. Uh, so I'll go into that and what I mean about that uh, in a wee bit more detail in the in the next slide. Uh, we've then got Power Automate. So this is a kind of you know powerful and scalable. Um, kind of automation type framework that can connect a variety of Microsoft and other uh, third party endpoints. So the idea being is that it can pick up data or it can look for changes in things and then it can start off a whole load of um, you know, different actions all the way through to the end. So it's very powerful uh, workflow based tool. Um, and you'll see some examples of, of how, we've, how we've used that um, for customers later on. And then at the very end there we've got power virtual agents. So really, you know, chatbots without the code. So we're seeing that more and more, you know, websites kind of interactive. You land on a website and somebody says, you know, do you have a question? And then, you know, you're able to, to interact with what you think is a person. But, you know, more and more that's not a person. It's actually just a, a chatbot um, that's, you know, been designed to kind of answer some of the common questions before handing off the more advanced tasks to, to a human. Um, so the Power Virtual Agents, you can build these chatbots without the code. So you can kind of, you know, use that kind of drag and drop, that kind of familiar interface with the, uh, that goes across kind of Power Apps and Power Automate to build these Power Virtual Agents and to build these chatbots uh, either within or outside of your, your organisation. So the bottom line there, um, each of these elements along the top, they also make use of each of the kind of four components at the bottom. So you, you, know, you can think of this as a kind of, you know, pick and mix, if you like, where your actual solution that you build, um, you know, may contain kind of one or more of these things. So you've got the data connectors at the bottom there. So whether they are you know, existing or whether they're custom created, there's the ability to kind of connect to and interact with data from a variety of different sources. So Microsoft offers about 300 odd data connectors out of the box that you can just you know connect to. So you can use Power Apps or you can use Power Automate to go and connect to a SQL Server or um, connect to you know data in an Excel spreadsheet, um, and then your know, outputs the same as well. That could be output to a SQL Server, it could be output to a SQL. Uh, an Excel spreadsheet as well. We then got portals. So the ability to kind of surface parts of your application or processes outside of the organization. Um, so this kind of facilitates a whole load of different scenarios around you know, cu customers being able to update their own data that you hold on them, or suppliers being able to carry out kind of key parts of a, a business process. Um, and we'll see how those portals can be branded up. Um, there's also a, there's a number of different kind of authentication scenarios there as well, where you know customers can come in or suppliers can come in and kind of register 
to be part of this process and be part of this service, um, or they can be invited in, um, or they can be given a login um, to go and log into that as well. Um, and this has some integration possibilities with uh, Azure Active Directory as well. And then the third one across, we've got AI Builder. So the ability to really just, you know, allow your applications or business processes to make use of some of the existing kind of Microsoft cognitive services. So I don't know if you've seen Microsoft have got some kind of what they call cognitive services uh, that sit in Azure, um, which do some kind of you know reasonably common tasks, but they're kind of infused a little bit with with AI. Um, so it's things like you know image recognition or text recognition um, or, or forms processing. So what you do there for the image one, for example, is uh, say we're looking for you know you want to wanted to identify like car registration numbers, for example. You would go to the service uh, within Azure. You would give it some examples of photos with car registration numbers in. You would tell it where those registration numbers were, and then after you've kind of trained that model, um, you then just every photo that you send to it after that, every graphic you send to it after that, it knows how how and where to pick out a car registration number for that. So you can see, you know, there's there's lots of different scenarios that that would be useful for, um, and also in the form processing one. The idea of being able to, you know, supply an invoice to the AI builder and get it to be able to split out the the cost, you know, the purchase order num number, lots of different information out of there, um, and then make use of that in the the wider business process as well. And then lastly, just on that slide there, the common data service. So this kind of powerful um, scalable data repository that can hold the data for your applications and, and processes. And there will be a bit more uh, information on that common data service later on because it kind of underpins quite a lot of this, uh, you know, the scalability and the, um, the practicality of the framework. So together all these bits make a really compelling offering um, that allows kind of business and IT to work together to tackle a variety of different use cases across all different parts of the organisation. And again, hopefully once we jump into some of the customer scenarios later on, uh, we'll start to see you know, the various different aspects and the various different areas of the, the business that can be affected by this. Okay, so you know, Power Apps uh, can take many many different forms. We've got a, a standalone kind of what they call a canvas app, um, which is really just the, the application with that kind of power apps as a kind of familiar look and feel uh, designed for desktop, tablet or mobile. Um, and really that can have multiple kind of data backends. So you could be using a SharePoint list there to, you know, to build your application or you could be using the, the common data services, uh, as I mentioned before. We've also got model driven apps, so they are similar to kind of dynamic CRM type style, so you know, CRM style, um, where the solution is driven off of the entities that you've created in the background. Um, so it quickly gets you to, you know, a kind of a consistent user interface, um, which is easy and quick to build because it's basically using those those data entities to generate the kind of uh, what we call the CRUD screens, they create creating update screens. So in the examples that I'm showing there on the slide, uh, this is just really, you know, where where can kind of power apps surface? So where where you know where can we see power apps? Where can we use them? So the top left hand corner there, we've got um, you know a SharePoint web part. So we can kind of build on the existing SharePoint web part or a custom list interface and expose some of the the power apps functionality within there. Um, in the middle at the top, you, you know, you can build a Power Apps application from an Excel sheet on on OneDrive. So you've got an Excel spreadsheet, and you want to actually, you know, build a an application from there. Uh, one point I would make is that it's not recommended for on any, on in any kind of a track and trace um, solutions. It's probably not a good idea to you know, to be running them with it. Um, and then last, at the top on the right hand side there is a uh, build. Microsoft Teams tab, 
So being able to have a Microsoft team there and um, being able to kind of add a tab and have people within that team uh, just really consume that that solution for, from within that tab. Um, so that's there just now. And also coming soon is the ability to kind of natively build these Power App solutions uh, within Microsoft Teams. So build a kind of cut down version from within Microsoft Teams. On the bottom left hand side there um, is really using the templates that are available within Power Apps. So within the designer, there's already some kind of built in templates that they help you out. So, for example, if you wanted to use, um, you'll build a solution around calendars, then there's a there's already a kind of template there that'll, that'll give you a calendar view so you can not start from scratch. And similarly for uh, emails as well, if you want to build a solution around emails, then there's solutions there to be able to do that as well. Um, in the middle at the bottom there, we're talking about surfacing data and applications in Outlook. So if you've got a business scenario where it's very much email based and the users are kind of responding to emails or they need to kind of get more contextual information around emails, then you can build that solution effectively as a, a sidebar within, within Outlook to kind of bring that context to them where they're working every day. And then lastly on the right is that people cards. So um, <clears throat> being able to kind of surface information about people so we see that already through Outlook where we've got those kind of LinkedIn extensions. Um, and again, you can you know extend that interface and, and bring out more, uh, more context for the, the business scenario in that, that place as well. I guess the thing is, again, similar to the last slide is, you know, in the reality of this, uh, one application could surface as one or more of these things to different people because the idea is that you're bringing the technology or bringing the context of the application to the people where they need it. So that may be that you've got one part of the process is very much, you know, people are in email every day and they're using that and they want to see the context in email. And then other people are working within Teams and they want to see the application within Teams. So you can use that interface to surf it, first surface the application both within Teams and within Outlook so that each of the groups of users you are not having to change how they work. Um, they can kind of be productive and see the context of the data as well. So just want to go through the kind of the anatomy, if you like, of a, a you know a power app um, and you know some of the, some of the other benefits of it. So you know any platform support. So. Power App supports all the major platforms. Um, so it supports the, kind of, the iOS, the Android, the Windows 10, um, you know, across the desktop, the tablet, mobile, um, and gives native access to the device capabilities, which is really interesting. So things like the camera, uh, the GPS location, uh, pen and ink, um, you know, so you can create applications where you've got people out in the field and they can go and they can get things signed or they can take a photo and then you know that will come right into the application that can form part of your your scenario um so you know that, that brings a, a lot of power in it in itself um to the application and the other thing is as well that you don't really need to go through any of the the kind of application stores so you don't need to go through google play or through the ios store you're doing this by installing the power apps application so you install one application on the mobile device and then every power app that you create really just kind of gets listed in there. Um, and you can create shortcuts on the, you know, on the phone and the desktop and things like that for those, those applications as well. Sharing the app like a, a document. So, you know, what Microsoft have done is made it really, really easy to be able to, to share your applications with other people within your team or with the wider organization. So sharing is almost like, you know, SharePoint kind of sharing, just being able to kind of, you know, a few clicks, type in an email address, and then that's that's the person got um, your know, permissions to the application. Uh, where the application has like, a, you know, CDS as its back end, the common data service, there may be a couple more things you want to do, because obviously you've got the ability to introduce you know, more kind of role-based security around it and start to kind of build a more enterprise application. 
But if you're building a simple team-based application, it's really just really easy to kind of just share it with your colleagues. The seamless integration is obviously built on top of Office 365. So you get that integration with uh, you know, Power Automate, Power BI, as I mentioned before. It's integrated with Teams, the wider Office 365, so the ability to kind of interact with, with SharePoint um, and some of the other functionality that that offers, as well as the Dynamics side, so the ability to kind of you know, interact with your dynamic CRM um, you know, and take some of that information out of there and just surface that within Power Apps as well. The simple design experience, so i talk briefly about the designer, um, but you know, effectively you've got this kind of drag and drop design experience. You can start from templates, so you can start from scratch. And the good thing about that is that the app is running with the data that you pull in as you build it. So you can quite easily and quickly see what's happening as you progress through the application. So you're not having to kind of guess what fields are going into there as you're allocating the fields. You can quite quickly run through the application as you've got it, um, you know, and see what's being populated in there and see the fields that you're working with and you know, and, and make sure that you're 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 going okay as you go along. And then lastly, just the, the data connectivity that I've touched on before. So being able to you know kind of make use of all those connectors that, uh, that Microsoft have, uh, have produced there. Um, and then the app logic. So, you know, just being able to put the formulas and things into the application and build into the application as well. And again, if you've used Excel, it's pretty similar to the kind of Excel formulas. Um, and then, you know, layered on top of that, you've got the, you've been able to make use of the, the AI uh, that Microsoft provide, and then other Microsoft and kind of third party services for more advanced logic if that's if that's required. Okay, so just moving on to um to Power Automate then. Um, so really, this is the kind of the workflow part of the process that I talked about earlier. I can introduce earlier on. You can see there the kind of designer um, aspect of it, where really you're able to connect with, um, you know, parts of Office 365 or connect with lots of external um, data sources, and then you know, kind of transform. So you think about it as that kind of ETL type process, where you want to be able to extract data from somewhere transform it in some way um, and load it into into something else. So, you know, it's, it's really easy to use. It's really graphical um, and it, it's just really easy and really, really flexible to kind of to kind of use. So um, lots of different good things about it. So, you know, there's a number of different triggers to kind of kick off these processes. So you've got things like, you know, I've added an item into my source solution. So that's the workflow knows then to kick off when the item has been added or if the item has been changed. Um, it can be triggered on a kind of event based or a schedule based. So, you know, run every day or uh, run when something happens. And also when the um, when a button's pressed, so you've got this idea that, you know, either mobile or desktop, you can kind of give people buttons to almost, you know, kick off that event. So if you want something to happen, somebody can go into their mobile and just actually you know, click the button and that'll, that'll kick off the process, you know, kick off Power Automate process, which is quite smart. The other thing to mention in here is there's a built-in approval centre. So what Microsoft have done is taken some of the common tasks around, you know, like document approval or approval of a process and built that into a, a kind of, you know, built-in approval centre. So uh, that means that if you've got any kind of a they're really easy to do because you can just push an approval um, out and then that approval centre you know, comes back, triggers uh, the person who needs to approve, they get an email, actually in line in the email they can go back and just approve or they can go to the approval centre and see all the approvals that they've got pending and then you know they can just work their way through the, through the approvals as well. So that's a really good kind of add-on feature that means that you're not having to to regenerate some of this.
And then just to cover the, the common data service, so the this is a, just the last part, if you like, in this kind of introduction uh, section, then I'll take a look at the chat and see if there's anything that needs, needs covered in terms of questions. So um, this really is the central data store for Power Platform. So if you're building any you know, kind of larger solutions uh, on the Power Platform, this is really where you want to be doing it. You know, this is what you want to be as, as your, your kind of back end. So there's, there's lots of different um, kind of advantages to doing that. Um, you know, it's it's built on top of Azure. Um, it's scalable. Um, it can be used as a data source across multiple different power apps. So if you build one solution and use the common data source, you can use that data source as your data source for additional power apps for different scenarios. So you can kind of ex expect, um, expand on the data uh, that's being stored in there and the data that's being being used in there as well. It's got role-based security built on top of uh, Azure Active Directory. Um, you can enforce the business rules. So you can enforce your business rules within the data so that you know no matter how many power apps you build on top of this um, or how many scenarios you've got using the data, your business rules are enforced within that within the CVS. Um, you've got things like duplicate detection in there as well. Um, so you can automatically kind of flag and deal with any duplicates that appear. Um, you've got good integration options with the kind of Azure Data Lake, uh, other relational databases. So you could be bringing in data from Azure SQL, you could be sending data out to Azure SQL, sending data out to your you know, Azure Data Lake for reporting scenarios as well. And then you've got event driven integration as well. So you know, when things happen either within CBS or outside of CBS, you can get it to uh, to make changes. Um, and also the webhooks, so you can get it to, you know, when a, when a row is added into CBS, for example, to trigger something else to happen. So a, an external solution to be able to pick up and, you know, carry out some of this uh, information, you know, carry out another part of this process. Uh, I should say at this point is this is not the only storage mechanism you know that you can use for power apps. It's just for a for a proper kind of enterprise end to end solution. Um, this is this is the best uh, mechanism to use. You can use a SharePoint list. So if you want to build a you know a simple power app, you know we built solutions that just use SharePoint lists as the data repository, um, and that'll work for you for you know for certain business scenarios. If you've already got an existing SQL or SQL Azure database. Um, then you can make use of that as well. So you you can use those existing uh, SQL databases and build and build your UI and build your kind of power app scenario on top of that as well. Um, and other databases. So what there are, that really kind of brings in is the this idea of building a kind of a new UI, if you like, on top of a, a legacy um, you know system that's that's there. Uh, and we'll see we'll see some of that. Um, brought out in some of the use case scenarios as well. Okay, just going to take a few minutes to just uh, scroll up the chat and see if there's any questions that I think Sammy's been kind of answering them as we go. Um, don't know, Ryan, is there any, have you seen any questions coming through that haven't been answered there? Yeah, there's yeah, a good uh, uh, power uh, dynamics. And power apps driven by the events. Yeah, so um, so so it seems to is that the one from Dave Watson here? So it seems to have an overlap with Dynamics workflow case functionality. So yeah, power apps can be driven. So the common data service is kind of built on top of like a lighter weight version of the the entities that you get from uh, from Dynamics. So there's really good integration there between Dynamics and uh, Power Platform and, and Power Apps. So if you want to drive um, something happening in Power Platform based off of events that happen in Dynamics, then that's that's definitely something that you can do yeah, using the, the Power, Power Automate part of the, the platform. Okay. There's an, another interesting question from 
Douglas about integrating power apps in a, in his strategy and some of the organisational challenges and Peter's just asked a question there. Um, how do we put in place normal engineering best practice? Um, really interesting questions. I would suggest that we maybe just delay uh, picking those up until we get towards the end of the session because I think we're going to yeah. cover that anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. So I've just seen Peter's question there. So yeah, that Peter, that that is going to come up later on. So we've got some uh, we've got some slides and some uh, chat later on about how to actually you know kind of start to put some governance around this because obviously it's one of these things that when you start talking about the power platform, you've got business users thinking, oh, this is great. You know, think of all the scenarios that we can we can use, and then you know. IT do that to a certain extent as well, but you've also got IT with their hat on saying, oh, how do we stop this from, you know, kind of proliferating everywhere across the organisation, not being able to control it, um, you know, having to support it, the, all the different scenarios that, uh, that people have as well. So um, we'll, we'll cover that later on, how you can set up some good governance and some good guardrails around that as well. Right, Rody has just flagged up a question from Diane there on licensing. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, licensing is an interesting one. So there is a, and to answer the licensing question fully, um, probably need to take a wee bit of that offline and just see what your individual scenario is. Um, there is some licensing considerations in terms of if you want to use the portal, there's a kind of add-on license. If you want to use, you know, some of the premium connectors, then there's some add-on licensing as well. And uh, you know, yeah, there's there's no getting away from it that there is a kind of add-on to this, so it, it it can be expensive. I would say, quite interestingly, what we've seen is that so that licensing change where they you know they started to do the premium connectors and things like that. That happened October 2019. And what we saw around about the kind of tail end of last year was organisations saying, right, you know, come and tell me how I can use Power Apps, but how I don't have to use any of the premium connectors. So, you know, how can I do this without using any, any add on functionality? So, you know, we, we did a, a few kind of projects for that, um, and that seemed to be the the kind of way that people were going for a certain certain amount of time. What we seem to have seen at the kind of turn of the year is people actually seeing the benefit that they can get from using these premium connectors and the benefit that they can get from using the portals, where the cost of it from a licensing point of view kind of outweighs um, the return on investment that they get for you know either the customer being able to play part of that scenario or being able to integrate with some of these um, kind of premium connectors. Um, and I think people were just finding that actually they were skirting round about it. Um, but actually, if they pay the license fee, they're getting the benefit out of it. I appreciate that's not going to be the case for everybody. Um, but I think that's just, you know, there is a licensing cost there, but you need to kind of have a look at that and decide for the business scenarios that I'm going to look at just now. You know, it may be the case that the first couple of business scenarios actually the cost of licensing seem, seems quite heavy. But, you know, once you've got it and you start, you've maybe got kind of five, 10 power apps, 15, 20, you know, wh wh what's the kind of break even point? Uh, you know, when do you start getting the benefit out of, out, out of having that? So I think it, it's one that, you know, I'm happy to take that. If you've got more info, if you want more information on that, Diane, I'm happy to kind of pick that up after the after the call. Okay, um, I'll just move on to the some of the use cases then. Um, and what I'm going to do at, at this stage is just outline some of the kind of high level um, use cases uh, that are available to us, um, and then I'm going to just kind of dig in a wee bit more into some of the customer. Uh, scenarios. So I know Douglas had just posted a message here saying interested to see some case studies uh, on ROI. So there are some Microsoft case studies, but I'll kind of informally, if you like, cover some of the, the ROI just in terms of time, uh, time saved uh, when I come on to some of the customer scenarios that we're going to talk about.
<clears throat> okay, so this slide here just shows some of the kind of you know the common broad use case scenarios where the power platform uh, can be used, and uh, you'll see you'll see some of these uh, some more of these scenarios once we once we kind of discuss the customer uh, use cases in in more detail. So the top left hand side there. Um, you know, I think we've already, there was a question about it earlier. So extending the functionality of existing M365 and Dynamics 365 out of the box experiences. So, you know, you've already got Dynamics, for example, um, and you're using that in a CRM scenario. Um, you can build a Power Apps Canvas app and you can put that Canvas app kind of in line with Dynamics CRM. So if you've got information that you want to display to the user at that point, that wouldn't normally be available based on the entities that they're currently using. Uh, that's that's something that you can do. So you can, you know, put a Canvas app into that uh, Dynamics uh, 365 environment. You can also build, uh, I touched on earlier, the kind of model driven applications. So this idea of a kind of driven by the entities that you create. So very much in the kind of Dynamics 365 style. Um, you create all the data fields and then you create an application and it gives you that kind of dynamics 365 look and feel uh, to be able to fill out all the fields and be able to go through the, the business process uh, kind of scenario. Um, on the right hand side there we've got extending legacy applications. You know where you've got legacy applications they maybe have a really high cost uh, for change you can build a power apps or a power platform scenario uh, to help you build a user interface to help you interact with say an ERP system for example uh, or feed data into that ERP system or get data out of that ERP system or out of that legacy system so it may be that you want to you know just surface part of the information uh, for a particular you know use case out of your legacy system um, or it may be that you're looking at, you know, keeping the legacy system, but building a kind of brand new user interface with a kind of longer term strategy of, you know, being able to then, you know, replace some of the back end as you as you go along. So you could see how you could quite quickly build a, a Power Apps kind of user interface using the, the legacy data and then start to replace the legacy data over time uh, with a new database, you know, be that common data service or, or something else. Uh, and then the bottom left hand side, so building mission critical end to end solutions. So, you know, building these kind of solutions that go right across your organisation, um, lots of different scenarios. So that may be mobile for some of the users, it may be desktop for some of the users, it may be within Dynamics for some of the sales users. Um, you know, some per self service Power BI out the back of it, some per virtual agents, and how it's just kind of integrate into the into the solution as well. And then the last one on the right hand side, so just building departmental solutions, so just solutions that will help a team or a specific department be more productive in their day to day work. So they may already be doing, you know, a business process. Um, maybe it's not really as streamlined as it could be and they could be saving quite a lot of time if they streamline the process. So now they've got the ability to, you know, go and just have a think about the process, see how they could streamline it and use the Power Platform to help them help them do that. OK, great. Thank, thanks for that. Um, just before we move on, Ryan, is, it, is there anything that you've picked up on the chat forum that hasn't really been Covered because Sammy's done a great job in answering a lot of the, the comments. Yeah, no, I think I think Sammy's answered most of them. There was maybe a question around the skills required to develop Power Apps and that how much coding ability and how much training would you need before you you would be able to kind of actually create some of this some of the stuff you've you've shown. So it'd be good to get Graham's view on that. Sure, I think what I'll do is I'll. I'll you know, conscious of the, the time as well, but I think I'll, we'll take that one into the kind of planning and the governance, um, yeah, because okay. back to just kind of mention how that, you know, citizen developer versus kind of pro developer and, you know, use there. Yeah, okay. 
Right, that's that's fine, Graham. Okay, thank thanks for the really interesting session, Graham. Um, we start we started off today saying that we were going to cover the the why of Power Platform, the what of Power Pl Platform, and we've covered both of those. So in the time remaining, I think we'd like to just say a few words about the how and the who of Power Platform. And the slide in front of us uh, basically says planning pays. And hopefully when we, we cover these issues, um, it will help to cover the two earlier issues that Douglas and, and Peter raised and, and we said we would cover those later. You know, applying, applying my uh, business school hat here, um, there's obviously huge potential for all organisations here in terms of power apps and, and, and power platform. But unless, my view, unless this thing is managed properly or planned proper, properly, you're simply going to get a proliferation of uncoordinated initiatives springing up all over the place. So there needs to be, in my view, some kind of structure put in place here. Uh, and the slides we're looking at, I'll cover the first two and then Graham will come back to the other ones and tie that into the governance aspect. In terms of know your starting point, Douglas, you had mentioned earlier about the need to build this into strategy. Knowing your starting point is, is where you look at Power Platform and really start to align it with the core strategic objectives of, of the organisation. And a very important issue there is getting the senior executive team on board. They, they don't need to understand how it works, but they need to understand the poten potential of this and how um, Power Platform would help, especially in the current situation, what the business benefits are um, and they need to agree what the team and the governance structure is, is going to be and, and Graham will pick up on, on that. The second point is obviously prioritising and building the, the business case and that's where uh, I think you just mentioned the whole ROI aspect. Now we're not necessarily talking here about the ROI of specific specific projects um, but the, the ROI in, in general. And a key issue under number two here is making sure that we differentiate between those power platform initiatives that will deliver real business value and those that won't, those that are just uh, maybe hobby projects. We need to prevent a proliferation of uncoordinated in, in initiatives and our ultimate objective here is to make sure that we are creating a strong portfolio of projects, power, power platform projects, which are matched and fully aligned with the core business objectives and the vision and the strategy of, of the organisation. Otherwise, we're just basically, in my view, going to go all over the place. Now, Graham, I'm wondering if, before I pass over to you for governance, could you jump to the slide with the different roles, the roles on it? Um, and I'll cover that and then I'll just pass back to, to you. Slide with the different roles on it? Uh, if you just move through the slides. Is it? Forward in the slide deck. Uh, forward, yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. That one, yeah. Okay, I'm going to pass by to Graham in a moment in terms of of governance. But what what we're looking at here is is just a wee framework that uh, was put together. Um, basically based on the work I was doing early, I mentioned earlier with the large housing organisation. And it really gets, I think, the message across here that the successful implementation of a power platform, power apps project is, is actually very much a team effort. 
and different parts of the organisation, different people in the organisation performs the different roles. So if I can start on the right hand side with the leaders, the, the senior executive team, their role is to empower people. Their role is to make sure that developments are fully aligned with the strategic vision of the organisation. Then there is what I call orchestrators. Now, I think Graham's going to mention in a moment the establishment of centres of excellence. So orchestrators are those who um, apply governance to to this to make sure there is not a pro proliferation of uncoordinated initiatives and any project that is developed fits with the strategic objectives of the business. Agents and teams, it is now widely accepted that successful transformation, accelerating the journey to becoming a modern intelligent workplace happens through small agile teams um, and Power Platform is particularly suitable for that. And working with change agents, those members of the team, members of the staff who are um, very positive about the need for change. And then the supporters are basically everyone else that supports this. It could be the IT department, it could be the training department, the staff development department and so on. And ultimately, I put customers there last because it's the most important one. The reason that we're doing this is to deliver value to our customers, whether that is what we generally recognise as customers or whether it's what we call internal customers, our staff, because it's now just totally accepted that unless we get our staff on board and get staff engagement on this, then transformation simply is not going to take place. So I just wanted to throw that into the discussion because there are, as Douglas pointed out earlier, there are major organisational and people and cultural aspects here which are, are vitally important. And on that, Graham, I'll just pass over to, to you if you want to pick up on the governance aspect. Great, thanks, sir. Just shift back. Slide. So, yeah, just just want to cover off the last few points on the on this slide here. The how. So, um, you know, the majority of the projects that we we've been carrying out with the Power Platform have been, you know, carried out in an agile manner. And the, the benefit that that's given is it, it does allow that those kind of small cross-functional teams eh, to work more closely together. Um, this the application of this technology is just works much better if you are able to get business and IT to kind of work together to create it. Um, the other, you know, on the on the towards the last uh, kind of two points as well, that kind of idea of like you know def, uh, designing and deploying, then refining, and then measuring and iterating. So it's always a good idea to kind of start small. Um, and then build a kind of like minimum viable product style approach of uh, of solutions. So you know, almost just enough to do the functionality, and then kind of start iterating through that. And you've seen some of that in the uh, you know the use cases that and the solutions that I showed you there, where you know we've maybe done you know you manually schedule an appointment just now, but in the future that might be integrated with Microsoft bookings. And so there's a there's a kind of trade off between you know what you automate straight off and then what you would what you would look to automate in the future. Um, and the reason for that is just really because you're working quite quickly, um, you, the users that are involved in the process, they're keen to kind of see the benefit of it. Um, but at the same time, it's quite easy to fall into this trap of like constant development where they really good if it did this, it would be really good if it did that. But your users over time are going to start to become kind of disengaged if they never actually, if the product never actually sees the light of day. So it's always good to kind of, you know, build to, you know, that kind of MVP stage, be able to get it in their hands, let them have a look at it, let them understand how it works. 
and then start making changes, you know, off the off the back of that, um, that kind of just iterative um, development approach. Um, otherwise, you can find yourself just kind of, you know, on a constant development journey where there's a constant backlog of things to be done and it never actually gets released. OK, just moving on to the, the governance. So I want to talk a bit about, um, you know, there's been some questions in the chat. Um, there's always an aspect that we're going to, going to cover as well around the, the governance of the per platform. So, you know, citizen de developers, as Microsoft talks about, they always make it sound brilliant, um, but quite quickly that can just spiral out of control. Um, you know, we've all heard stories of, you know, kind of per BI reports or reports that are created by somebody somewhere in the organisation. They get shared to be a bit wider in the team and the team go, oh, they're brilliant, you know, why have we not been using them? And then before you know it, the company's running off that report. And then, you know, six months later, you find out that actually the data source that that was running off of isn't valid or isn't getting, you know, kept up to date or whatever. Um, there's all sorts of scenarios that you know, have happened like that as well. So we're going to look at, you know, just some ways to mitigate that and also some things that you can do to just put some governance in place. And then we're going to look at the kind of governance journey and how that can be started um, and then how you can you know kind of progress in that as you as you mature uh, with, with our platform. So this model here shows a, um, how a typical organization may adopt a per platform uh, with you know kind of talk about citizen developer. Uh, starting with no support, you know, champion. Then they then become champions. Uh, IT start having to provide some some support, and then a centre of excellence model um, you know, gets gets done at the end. It's quite interesting this slide because this is a Microsoft slide, but um, I've put it in because it's almost like a bit of an an anti pattern to I think what should what should actually happen. Um, we would always advise that. You know, there's some planning carried out as the first stage, and that doesn't need to be the full. Uh, I know Sammy's kind of had some uh, some chats about the the centre of excellence um, with, with some of you. It doesn't always involve having to stand up the full, you know, centre of excellence, but there's a, some really good tools uh, in the centre of excellence toolkit that Microsoft provide that can be put in as a, a kind of light touch um, approach. So. I'll talk a bit more detail about that um, later on, but it's much easier to kind of put those guardrails in place first and then extend that capability out uh, instead of trying to kind of retrofit that governance into the. So we would really advise to you know, move that kind of centre of excellence piece uh, along to the left. And the good thing is that gives IT a wee bit more control as well. So really it kind of you know, tips the whole thing. Uh, over to, to the left. Okay, um, talking about some kind of easy first steps that you can take for governance. So, you know, even before you put the centre of excellence in, there's some tools within the uh, the Power App um, kind of environment that you can just, you know, use straight off. So there's a solution checker and an app checker. Um, making use of them will just ensure that the quality of our applications are kept high and kept in line with best practice. Um, and that would be a that's a really easy solution to kind of implement at the start of the journey. So if anyone's creating any solutions, they should have been ran through the solution checker and through the app checker, um, first of all, just really to give them a level of kind of quality, um, you know, before you start start doing anything else. And then, you know, how do you continue the journey? So we've got the Centre of Excellence kit that we've talked about. You know, it's offered by Microsoft. It's a set of components that cover kind of three distinct areas. So you've got the core area, the compliance area, and the nurture area. So in the in the core area, we've got tools that can help us kind of catalogue these uh, resources that the tenant are using. We've got some scenarios that help us the, through a kind of data loss prevention um, kind of scenario. So we'll be able to kind of block and unblock connectors. So if you're in a particular environment, then you can't 
call certain connectors. Um, you can only use the connectors that have been provisioned for you. So you can start to kind of lock down scenarios um, that mean that people can't use certain data in certain, uh, certain environments. You can change the app ownership. So you're kind of lever, joiners, movers. You don't end up with orphaned uh, power apps. You've got somebody that can take over the, the ownership of that as well. Uh, from a compliance point of view, you've got the ability to kind of audit the applications. You know, how are they being used? Are they not being used? Um, are they using lots of resources? Um, and then you can carry out actions based on how people are using those connectors. So are people trying to connect to data sources and then convert the data in some way that you don't want them to do that? You can kind of get a wee bit of an audit on that and start to kind of follow up uh, what people are doing with these applications. And then you've got the whole nurture side. So the idea that as when you when you move to a you know more a kind of citizen developer, you've got more developers um, you know kind of making these these per platform applications. You've got a kind of onboarding process, so you can point them to your training material and your guidance material. You can encourage that kind of adoption. You can share the the kind of best practices there as well. Um, We've done, you know, we've done some of this uh, governance work before. So, you know, we've customers have asked us to kind of come in and, you know, this whole thing that we're talking about just now. You know, how do we put these guardrails in place? How do we get this kind of practical advice on, you know, what bits of the centre of excellence we should use just now? What should that kind of journey look like? Um, you know, what does an environment strategy look like for Power Platform? So, you know, this slide here outlines that kind of journey. Um, and obviously, you know, we, we can we can help with that as well. So, that said, I'm just going to hand back to Jim um, just to kind of sum up on the, uh, you know, the, the key points that we've talked about. Um, you know, key points for me really are that, you know, business involvement in the process is key. Um, we want to take an iterative approach to doing um, development. And just, I guess, to some of the, the things that we've been talking about in the chat, you know, it's probably not that you're going to start with a whole load of citizen developers. It will probably be IT that starts the development on this or a partner that you've got that starts the development on this. But what you should be doing is you should be putting those processes in place to put that early governance and those guide rails in place that then means that that could be expanded out easily to the business further down the line as they see some of the scenarios that are building and they see, you know, it starts to gain a bit of traction within the, uh, within the organisation. And I think that kind of um, mirrors with what we are seeing, you know, as a partner, we're not seeing huge amounts of uh, citizen developer um, right now, but I think that will come in future as the, the scenarios and as the kind of power platform applications start to make their way into organisations. Uh, and the business start to see that they can kind of pick up and do some of this as well. Thank you, Jim. Thank, thanks very much. Um, just before I, I wind up, uh, there's a quick question come in there by Peter. I don't know if you can comment on it just very, very briefly. Um, yeah, yeah. So just, yeah, so just on the configuration, the version yeah. management, the testing. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, when you start talking about this, there's loads of different aspects that you could cover. Um, there is uh, some application lifecycle management tools uh, for Power Apps. So being able to kind of manage the pipeline of uh, these Power Apps solutions all the way through a kind of dev test production and be able to uh, kind of test the quality of them, carry out some testing and things like that as you go through. Um, some of that's there right now. Some of that's still to come. Um, and, you know, had I had more time today, I would have covered some of those aspects as well, but happy to pick up um, offline with you, Peter, if you want to discuss that in more detail as well. OK, Graham, thank you. Um, conscious of the, the time here, um, thanks, Graham, for a very comprehensive, very detailed uh, presentation. Um, just to wind up, you know, you know, I'm there's no doubt in my mind that the time, the time for Power Apps, Power Platform is is now. Um, just listen, listening to Graham's presentation, the potential, the potential here is absolutely enormous, um, especially in the current 
very uncertain environment that we, we live in. I think the key message I've taken out of today's session is not only the potential, but the fact that there are uh, best practice advice in place and procedures in place for making sure that we we implement this successfully and, and effectively. Um, being very much a combined effort between the technology and software development aspect and the business aspect. Um, so in conclusion, I'd just like to thank everyone for uh, attending today. We've had a, an absolutely fantastic turnout today, so thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule. For all your comments on, on the chat forum, it's been absolutely brilliant. And the slides and the recording of the video will be will be made available in in course.